Paul Rafi. I'm a World Affairs Council of Orange County, and I'm a national board member. It is my privilege and honor to introduce the speakers in the panel today. In December 2010, a fatal act by a single individual in the streets of Tunisia was fed up with being pushed around by the authorities and the corruption set himself on fire. And that set a firestorm of protests and uprising starting in Tunisia, spread across the country. And 28 days later, President Zainal Abedin was ousted. That incident encouraged the peoples of Egypt, Bahrain, Syria, and Libya to follow the same path. Today we have a panel of experts we we'll talk about the Arab Spring. Moderating the session is Katie McFarland. She is the National Security Analyst for Fox News and appears regularly on Fox News and Fox Business News. She held national security posts in the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administrations. She started at a very young age. And she was an aide to Henry Kissinger on the NSC staff. Next we have Ambassador John Negroponte, who is a career ambassador, we learned about that this morning, one of the very few, of two I believe. He had several posts in numerous countries, including the one in Iraq in 2004 and 2005. He was a director of national intelligence 2005-2007, and became the secretary, deputy secretary of state in February 2007, under Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. We also have with us Robert Wright, who is a journalist, author, and foreign policy analyst. She is currently a USIP Senior Fellow, Wilson Center Distinguished Scholar. During her fellowship, Wright has written books, two of, one of which is outside, I believe, Rock the Caswell, Rage and Rebellion Across the Islamic World, and the Iran Primer, Power, Politics, and U.S. Policy. Wright has reported from more than 140 countries on six continents for the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Sunday Times of London, CBS News, and the Christian Science Monitor. And last but not least, we have Ambassador Peter Grandolovich, of the Czech Republic, and he's an ambassador of the United States. Again, all of these uh, speakers have a very lengthy bios that I refer to the back of the program that we have. Um, ambassador Gandolovich previously served as a member of the Chamber of Deputies in the Czech Republic, 2006-2011. And during this time, he was a member of the Foreign Committee from 2010 to 2011 and a member of the Agriculture Committee from 2009 to 2010. So I turn over to Katie. Um, I'm Katie McBride, I'm a brunette on Fox News. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just have really confused things. We have another brunette here, Robert Wright, and we wore Christmas colors to get you in the season and in the mood. Now, if you had come here a year ago to talk about the Middle East, what would we have talked about? We would have talked about Iran. We would talk about Israel. We for sure would have talked about Iraq. We would never have talked about the countries we're going to talk about today. And if we had handed out a map to all of you, maybe not all of you because you're actually very well informed, but if we had, held a, had handed out maps to an equivalent group and said, pick out Tunisia and Libya and Morocco and Algeria, you know, how many people would have gotten it right? Very few. So that was a year ago. <laughs> Well, you would have all gotten it right because, of course, you know all these things. And we're going to quiz you on who the capitals, you know, the capitals and the prime ministers and the foreign ministers are at the end of this session. Now, six months ago, nine months ago, six months ago, if we had had this conversation, we would have all talked about Truman Square, we would have talked about Tunisia, we would have talked about all the exciting things that would happen, uh, were happening. And six months ago, we would have talked about Libya and Gaddafi. And even people like Nate Sharansky from Israel was talking about there's a wave of democracy that's sweeping from the Atlantic all the way over to the Persian Gulf. And it looked like good times were coming. 
Well, we got rid of Osama bin Laden. Al Qaeda was on the ropes. There was a new narrative going on in the Middle East. So here we are today. Things aren't looking so good. Uh, Tunisia's had an election, and the Islamic Party has prevailed. If there were an election held tomorrow in Egypt, all the polls tell you that the Muslim Brotherhood would probably prevail. Uh, in Libya, what was supposed to happen in days, not weeks, happened in months. And there's an uncertainty as the Al Qaeda flag has been flown above the courthouse in Benghazi. Where is all this leading? So that's today. Now we've got an amazing group of people who have all sorts of different backgrounds. We have an intelligence official, former high state department official. We have one of the leading scholars in the Middle East, a lady who wrote the book Rock the Casbah and was talking about this years before it happened. So we're proud of you. And we have somebody who actually knows how revolutions work and how countries get rebuilt in the ambassador from the Czech Republic who was part of his country's revolution when the Iron Curtain fell. I want to ask you, from all of the experiences that you've had, to give us an overview of what you think has happened and where you think it's going. We'll start with the ambassador. That ambassador. Well, first of all, about the bloom being off the rose, I'd say not so fast. I mean, uh, these things take time. Uh, I'm old enough to have lived at a time when there were uh, quite a few authoritarian governments in the better part of Europe. Uh, so, uh, Bill Burns this morning was talking about the Western Hemisphere and the uh, great progress, and I'm glad he took note of it, that they had made towards uh, democratizing their countries. But when I entered the United States Foreign Service, uh, most governments in Latin America were authoritarian, military di dictatorships, what have you. Amazing change when you look back. So, as we live through these events, of course we're impatient. We want things to happen really quickly. But let's not forget, uh, democracy can't be uh, built uh, overnight. Uh, it's uh, freedom uh, in our own conception of things is sort of indivisible. What is it for me to be a free person? But when you think about it, and you think about the institutions that have to be created to support human freedom, they're kind of discreet, they're separate. There's elections, there's freedom of expression, freedom of the press. There's judicial institutions, and today I think one of the things we come up against in a lot of new fledgling democracies is the problems you confront with uh, the establishment of the viable, effective judicial institutions and civic uh, institutions. So I would say you're seeing the beginning of the process. Uh, we're nowhere near the end of it. It's going to take, uh, it's going to go well beyond my lifetime, and I think uh, over uh, the next several generations. Perhaps someday we can look to the Middle East, being able to achieve what Latin America uh, has achieved during the past 25 or 30 years. But I would just end with one, uh, reminding you all of one fact. The Spanish Empire collapsed at the beginning of the 19th century. The Ottoman Empire collapsed at the beginning, beginning of the 20th century. So arguably you could say that the Middle East region, in some respects, is about a century behind Latin America. Okay, well, we're talking about empires collapsing. Here's someone who's lived through an empire collapsing, and when the Iron Curtain came down, all of these different countries had different stories and different arcs of development. Um, we tend to look at the Middle East now and say, well, this is an empire that's changing. Most of these countries have leaders who have been in power longer than the majority of their populations have been alive. What are some lessons that you learned? Well, I think that uh, the main difference is that uh, we had uh, leaders uh, to lead us through the, the revolutions of uh, 1989. Uh, we had uh, Václav Havel, a uh, playwright turned president, uh, unmistakable moral authority. Uh, the Poles had uh, Lech Walesa, the union leader, uh, freedom fighter. And that's probably what is missing in this region, in this region, in these countries, that uh, these revolutions began from uh, the bottom up, uh, led by uh, young people, frustrated young men. To Which is what you were in, Czech, in Czechoslovakia when you were uh, They don't have any uh, any leader to uh, to be led by. Uh, they don't have any uh, idea, and that's something that I. Uh, 
think that it's a little bit of a problem because, uh, as you said, uh, uh, the, the movements uh, of Islamist uh, uh, parties or movements are gradually taking over and filling that, uh, that void. Okay, now let me ask you, Robin, because you've written about this. You're one of the people who saw the warning signs coming, uh, whether it was in Iran or it was in North Africa or the Middle East. What lessons are you pulling from this? I think there are three broad lessons. There, because I think there's something that's historic, not just because of millions of people turning out in the streets. I think you see three different components of it. One is the challenge to the global status quo which is mirroring what's happened elsewhere over the last 30 years with the demise of communism in Eastern Europe, the um, collapse of military dictatorships in Latin America, the end of apartheid and minority rule in Africa. So that's one component. The second component, which we often don't pay enough attention to, is that in the world's most volatile region, the idiom of uh, opposition uh, is peaceful civil disobedience. This is a part of the world where suicide bombs and Molotov cocktails and rockets have been a traditional way of uh, challenging. And so when it comes to our own national security priorities and dealing with extremism, uh, we find that our greatest allies now are uh, among the young people and the people turning out on the streets. So that's a second component, separate I think just from the challenge to autocracy, it's the challenge to extremism. The message everywhere is we are not following the model of Osama bin Laden. We are following um, something that's quite different. And that, I think, is, is what is enduringly important for us. And the third, I think, thing that's interesting is that despite the emergence of Islamic groups, and I distinguish sometimes, you know, there are different kinds of Islamist groups, and they're not all kind of fanatics, <clears throat> is the rejection of rigid Islamist ideology, evident most of all in Iran, uh, but even among the Islamist groups that are running today, you find a tremendous shift. We're kind of in the fifth phase of the Islamic revival. And people are, are uh, whether it's Ennahda, the Renaissance party uh, that won in 40%, in a contest with over 100 parties in Tunisia. They are today talking about making a coalition with two secular groups and honoring the kinds of women's rights progress that have been made earlier by the secular state. When it comes to Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, yes, we'll probably get a plurality, probably not a majority. And it will have to collaborate too. We keep forgetting that there are 88 <coughs> members of the Muslim Brotherhood that were in Hassan Mubarak's last, or that were parliament during Hassan Mubarak's last government. So, um, and, and you find that the same forces that, are ch that challenge the autocrats and extremists are now challenging some of the senior leadership in the Islamist groups and saying, your leadership wasn't elected democratically, you're kind of supreme leaders. Uh, your positions on women and minorities like the Coptic Christians are outdated. And so the dynamics within the Islamist groups are changing. And while I think that there's no question the next decade is going to be incredibly tough, more turbulent than the last decade. And I agree completely with John that I think that we're on a hopeful track of um, gradual change, and it's going to be very gradual, I mean, and, and it's going to have its ups and downs. Um, I call it a wild ride. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the status quo was not tenable, and um, it took too long to get where we are today. But I think it will play out in a way that people who now understand that they not only have power, but they know how to use it. Let me ask a, a question that only would happen today. Um, social media, what role did it play? And then secondly, a, a question which uh, I went back when this all started and I looked at baby boom generations throughout history. And every time there's been a baby boom generation, really, I mean, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, the American Revolution, the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Movement of the United States, and now, in the Middle East, an awful lot of baby boom generations, when there's a big bulge in demographics, they get rested and they try to throw off the status quo. So it's almost like you can chart, when's the next one coming? Well, when the birth rate dies. Um, so how much of this is a, is a generational revolution? And how much of it is aided by, in this particular generational movement, social media? Throw it out to anybody. I'm happy to tell answer. I'm happy to take it. I have to hear. Look, um, of the 
300 million Arabs, two thirds of them are under the age of 30. It's the largest proportion of baby boom um, in, in the world. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm a great believer that it was not only the baby boom, the three factors, baby boom and literacy. For the first time, you have the majority uh, of the populations in the Arab world uh, who are literate. They may not have high school or college degrees, but they, um, they can reach out beyond their village. They know how to get on the internet and, and so forth. And that includes women in the two most repressive Muslim societies. Saudi Arabia and Iran, over 60% of the university students are today female. Um, and, and the third thing is the tools of technology. And I do think this is where the culture of change is as important as the politics of change, whether it's the young rappers who were putting their songs on their Facebook page. And even before we saw Hamid Bouazizi you know, set himself on fire in Tunisia, that there was um, something that's been budding for quite a while that facilitated then the politics of Okay, um, when well, I, I, I would just agree that the social media definitely facilitated the communication between the people, and uh, uh, it may be even only that uh, uh, there is a difference uh, between one way communication, which was the case uh, with the Iranian revolution, when, uh, when uh, they used uh, the video, the, 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 the audio tape as the means of spreading uh, all the message, but there was any feedback, of course, possible, so there was uh, preaching uh, one way, but the social media, of course, uh, by its um, own, uh, um, by its own definition, are two-way communication, but I would uh, exaggerate uh, the importance of the social media, and I would even uh, say that it was only the mediator of it, and the causes were probably much more the demography, uh, economy, and all these things that uh, made people angry. Because if they were angry, they would just uh, uh, exchange all sorts of uh, messages on the social media. But the social media then activated them yeah. to allow them to, to sort of yeah. ask them between aspirational and then yeah. achieving it. Um, let, me, let me put you on the hot seat. Mr. Ambassador, who's been in government, you've been in the executive branch, you've worked on the Hill, you've been in all parts of the executive branch, you've been a consumer of intelligence as well as a provider of intelligence when you were director of national intelligence. Um, if you go back and look between the fall of the Shah of Iran, 1978, 1979, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain coming down, the Berlin Wall coming down, uh, the rise of Islamic Jihad, the Arab Spring. Other than Robert Wright, if you've been reading her book, she knew the Arab Spring and what was going to eventually happen, but the CIA didn't know. The CIA missed all these. Is there something wrong with the rape of intelligence? And I don't mean to be critical of you, no, you no. have a job. <laughs> Intelligence failures, yeah. Actually, I teach a little bit about this together also, and I commend to my students Roberta Wolstetter's book on Pearl Harbor, because it's still a classic on the subject of surprise and the subject of uh, distinguishing uh, noise from signals. And uh, of course, let's not forget, and it would be, we got to be fair here, uh, you know, uh, wisdom and uh, knowledge is, uh, memory is, uh, uh, hindsight is 2020 vision. And uh, it's always easy to go back and connect the dots after you uh, reconstruct events. It's certainly a hell of a lot easier. And if you think about it as a philosophy of history, when you look back, the longer the distance or time between us and historical events, the more inevitable events seem to have been. Whereas at the time we're living through them, they aren't necessarily, they aren't inevitable at all. So I think we're in a little bit of the same situation with regard to our intelligence community. You can spot trends, you can do analyses, you can uh, understand the underlying conditions uh, in a country, but predicting when it is that some spark, and we all agree that whatever the conditions were in North Africa and the Middle East, it was a spark that launched this particular event. Uh, it's kind of hard to foresee sparks, and it's certainly hard to distinguish uh, a spark or a noise from a signal. So, you know, I, I think we have an excellent intelligence community. And sometimes we even make some pretty brilliant prognostications. But uh, 
forecasting is really not uh, the primary mission of an intelligence organization. Um, okay, I want to go back to what you were talking about and the revolutions that you experienced. And General Hayden, uh, who spoke yesterday, he has on previous occasions said that, you know, a revolution that happened when, when the Iron Curtain came down and when the Russian and Soviet Revolution happened, he said to get a million people in a square to protest and demonstrate, as happened in Poland, it took months of organizing. And between when the spark started and when you actually could assemble that many people, it may have started as a grassroots movement, but by the time you actually got a million people in the square, leaders had started to emerge, like you were saying, you had leaders when that happened. And General Hayden said that in this event, you know, you can have the beginning, the spark is lit, and you have a million people in Tulare Square within a couple of days. And so leaders haven't had an opportunity to emerge. Is that something that then makes a difference from when you're saying we should have more strategic patience on, on waiting for these revolutions to result in leaders emerging? Well, I think now you're getting down to cases. So now, and that's what's going to be my uh, next point. And you really have to start going to each of the individual uh, countries and discussing the specific conditions that we prevail. But I mean, as a general rule, I would say a couple of things. I think it depends on what institutions exist in that country and survive the turmoil. For example, is there a strong uh, military institution? Is there a strong Islamic political force like the Muslim Brotherhood? And also, I think things depend a lot on economic conditions. Have they been totally discombobulated by events, or has the economic situation remain more or less intact. So anyway, I think you need to discuss okay, all those well, factors. Let's do that. Tolstoy once said that every happy family is the same story, and every unhappy family has a different story. Why don't each of you pick your favorite country and tell me what you think the story is in Egypt or in Tunisia or in any country that you're familiar with, and what is the trajectory happening there? Throw it open, anybody. And if you go first, you get more of a choice. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take Tunisia since it was the first, and I'd make one point about it. The social media thing. I mean, the fact is, Mohammed Bouazizi, the fruit vendor, was not the first one to set himself on fire. This had happened before, and it was the fact that his family went down and started throwing money across the governor's uh, gate, saying, "Here's your bribe. Here's the bribe you wanted." And it was that that was picked up by on YouTube and then put uh, put on the web and picked up by Al Jazeera. So, you know, when it comes, it's it. There had been other sparks, but this one was documented. Um, look, Tunisia is, in many ways, um, the one that could be hopeful because it's a small population. It's got a terrible economic problem because it's loss of tourism, which accounts for 400,000 jobs, uh, and you know is, is a real danger. But you have the most moderate Islamist party with a long track record. You know, it, um, uh, the head of the Rashid Kanushi, I've known him for, for many years. He's head of my living room in Georgetown. 20 years ago, arguing about Islam and democracy were not only inevitable, they would emerge, uh, merge, but uh, they, they were good for the West, too. And you know, now he's got to prove it. And the interesting thing is that there's not a single Islamist group that uh, may do well in election that doesn't face enormous challenges. And it's going to get stuck with creating jobs and all the tasks uh, of creating a new state, and yes, there's a danger that in the process of writing a constitution they may have disproportionate weight, but all of these issues about women's rights, about minority rights, be it ethnic or religious, are all on the table in, in all of these countries. They're, you know, they're discussed not just by us in the quarters of, of power in Washington, they're also discussed publicly there too on social media, so that there is um, a lot, there are far more dynamics happening. Uh, and Tunisia is one where, in terms of the politics anyway, maybe not the economy, but the politics may be um, really important in creating a model, just as it was in providing the spark that set this off. And I want to take another country? Well, I'd take a, maybe try to compare to Egypt and uh, Libya. For there you go. Because it seems to me that there's some interesting contrast there. It seems to me that the problem with Libya has is that once the dictator is removed, it's a bit like Iraq, there's, there's no real institutional base there. That everything kind of disappeared with him. I mean, he was... Including the weapons of mass I mean, he was the, the Libyan 
uh, he was the Libyan institution and the Libyan government. So they've got that weakness. On the other hand, not unlike Iraq also, they have uh, substantial wealth, relatively small population, and this oil wealth, which wasn't destroyed or in any particular way harmed as a consequence of this uh, revolution. So that uh, they're going to be able to afford to do things that are going to be able to address some of the problems of their country if they can get their political act together. Egypt, I think, has some fairly strong institutions. The army, obviously, which has been playing a very important role. There's some civic institutions that are quite strong. <coughs> Uh, and uh, it's got uh, a little bit more uh, of a long-term tradition of governance uh, in various forms. But they're poor. I mean, the country does not have a lot of natural resources. And I think that the revolution there has been a huge blow to their economy. They had an incipient uh, sort of business class. They were starting to do some manufacturing for uh, overseas markets. Um, Tourism is a very important fact in the economic life uh, of Egypt, and that uh, is, has gone quite badly since the revolution. So, you know, they've got a different set of challenges. So, you know, you can go from country to country, and I think you have to start analyzing and dissecting what is what are the problems that these countries are going to have to address. In that, and taking that, what problems are they going to have to address? You know, money is going to help grease the skids in some of these countries, but what happens in what, what role can the United States play? And I want to turn to you because the United States did play somewhat of a role oh, in, the, in the Iron Curtain. And is there a role, and, and for example, the United States played very little role after the Iranian Revolution. Is there a role for us, the United States, to play in this, these empires collapsing and the creation of new countries so that we hope that it tilts in our direction and not in the direction of the Muslim Brotherhood, which would be the next question. So tell me well, about it. Well, I, I think there is not only the role of the United States in the region, but uh, it, there is a role for countries like us together uh, with the United States, because, uh, uh, of course, we uh, talk about uh, the creation of, uh, uh, of a new society, of, of, of the building uh, uh, of uh, civil society, of institutions, of, uh, uh, of um, rule of law. These are things which uh, uh, may be learned by uh, an example of the others. And uh, this is where the United States can pretty much use our example. Not only that uh, we've been through uh, some of uh, that process, but also that the United States may not be that overwhelmingly welcome uh, on the ground with its uh, monies, with its uh, activities. So uh, in the cooperation with uh, us, uh, I'm not saying that we are the preachers of, uh, of some uh, uh, new society, but uh, uh, again, we've been through the process. We have learned our lessons, we have made our mistakes. We know how to avoid these mistakes, perhaps in the future. And the United States, uh, uh, can say, okay, we are bringing you people who can uh, give you this uh, uh, this example. So that's uh, a tremendous uh, area of cooperation between the United States and uh, the countries of the Central European region. Okay, and then in that regard, when your countries created themselves or recreated themselves, they did move towards, and actually towards democracy. When we're seeing these elections in the Middle East and self-government, it seems that the Muslim Islamist, Islamic, Islamicist parties are, are coming to the fore. Do we have anything to worry about with the Muslim Brotherhood? If the Muslim Brotherhood starts winning, will this be Hamas all over again? One man run for all one time. I was actually in the Palestinian territories for the election in 2006, and there was no question that the, um, Hamas was going to win. But for reasons that we don't always take into account, one was the fact that it was a no vote against Fatah, the Yasser Arafat branch of the PLO that had dominated and so profoundly corrupted. And, you know, I often said this was a vote against the Backstreet Boys, um, who were the thugs in the leather jackets coming around, you know, asking for protection money and so forth. And it was also a clumsy move by Fatah, which ran too many candidates to get the vote. So Hamas won for a, a lot of reasons. There was. Um, uh, there were a lot of people who supported them, but there were a lot of people who voted for them as an alternative. I think 
uh, one of the problems in all of these new societies, the re societies that recreate themselves, is the fact that you don't have, um, whether it's the leaders or the political experience, you don't have groups that can step in very quickly with the kind of institutional base and experience and resources that it takes to run candidates in a very short time. And the military, frankly, has become increasingly more like a junta than it has uh, a, a transition force, even though they keep swearing they want to uh, ensure the you know, that they hand over power um, because they haven't lifted martial law or emergency rule has been in place since Sadat's assassination in 1981. It hasn't. Um, it didn't announce the election law until September or November elections, you know. Uh, uh, you think how long elections take in this country, God forbid, um, uh, to ask a country that's going through its first democratic election to give candidates two months to get out there uh, and, and brand, identify, get their names that are totally unknown out there. So um, it's, there's no question that those parties that are known and are seen as less corrupt. This is a big factor. A lot of the rejection of the status quo had to do with um, the corruption, the injustice of regimes, not just you know, this quest for freedom, um, which is part of it, but you know, there, it was a rejection of things too. And um, so I'm not crazy about the Muslim Brotherhood, to put it mildly, but uh, you know, there are those from the reconstituted old parties in, all, in Egypt and um, uh, who, who will also probably do fairly well, and that's not great for the political system. The real tragedy is that the three different forces, the military, the reconstituted also part of the parties from the Austrian regime, and the New Democrats, the New Democrats that have the least experience and ability. And so the, the kind of first round that, uh, of course, will have a lot of sway in writing constitutions will not be parties that um, any of us are really happy about. Can I come back to, uh, and maybe link the two issues, Can come back to what the U.S. or the international community can do. I think that of all the regions in the world, one of the least integrated with the global economy is the Middle East. I mean, if you subtract, if you factor out oil, there's practically not much else in terms of what they uh, export, uh, any kind of the supply chain integration of the manufacturing operations and so forth. So to the extent that we can uh, use the current situation as an opportunity to think of ways of reintegrating or integrating the Middle East into the global economy, I think that would be extremely important. And let's face it, uh, economic hardship just makes these, these political obstacles and difficulties more more challenging to overcome. So a little bit of prosperity, both in our own countries and in the Middle East, I think would help uh, solve some of these issues, certainly make them easier. Right. Yeah, you jump in too, absolutely. I just jump uh, uh, in one of my uh, past lives, I uh, been the Minister of Agriculture of the Czech Republic, and I participated in a number of uh, meetings regarding the common agricultural policy. And that's one of the problems Europe uh, has vis-a-vis uh, -vis this region because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, Europe uh, uh, makes uh, more stuff that it can consume. So it spends a lot of money that it uh, subsidizes the exports of uh, these uh, commodities uh, elsewhere, uh, including uh, the Northern Africa region, where it uh, literally kills uh, the economy because this is, this is where uh, the agricultural products uh, can be uh, can be grown and made uh, much uh, much more efficiently than they are in Europe. So, with the, the common agricultural policy and with all the tariffs uh, policies, uh, Europe's not uh, very well serving uh, to the stability. So, in other words, it, it, it competes yeah. with cheap food I'm, products, and then as an ambassador of the Czech Republic, a member of the country of the European Union. I may not be supposed to be criticizing this part of our uh, of our common Say that right policy. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a discussion, and the Czech Republic has always belonged to uh, the group of countries that uh, advocated uh, the more liberal, I mean, liberal in terms of economic uh, liberals and uh, liberal policies towards uh, uh, towards this region. Okay, I'm going to ask one question while well, well, you think of the questions that you're going to ask. I'm going to throw this open to the audience. But the question I want to ask everybody is the 
One country we've not talked about, and we haven't talked about this entire conference, is Israel. Where is Israel in all of this? Throw it up in anybody. Well, it's democratic to start with. Uh, and secondly, if you listen to Andy Scotland, for example, who was one of my counterparts, who was the head of the uh, Israeli uh, military intelligence, when he came here on a fellowship after retiring, he, one of the points he made was, well, for once, this is a situation for which they can't blame Israel. <laughs> so I think they took a little bit of consolation as to what was happening. But if I were Israel right now, uh, I guess my biggest concern, which I think probably ought to be our biggest concern, is wither Egypt. Because if Egypt goes in a direction that ultimately puts stresses and strains on the whole Middle East peace process and on the Camp David Accords and the Egyptian recognition uh, of Israel, that could cause serious complications and problems. Uh, I guess I'd say that we, you know, the past 10 months have really been stunning in the fact that Israel has not been the issue, nor has the United States. This has all been internal. Um, there is the danger now that with the Palestinian moving toward to, if, if the United Nations to um, get formal membership, full membership, that we begin to see these two issues intersect again and get derailed, as John um, indicated. That, and the focus begins to be um, the nature of the conflict, where it goes next. I think the Israelis have not, uh, have not known how to respond to the Arab uprisings. And as a result, they haven't done very much. I mean, the whole argument they always made was, well, we're a democracy, you know, and they're not. And as they struggle to become democracies, then the issue becomes, you know, well, why are, aren't you doing more to make peace? I think the Egyptians do not want another war. I think that's overwhelming, even though that the new crowd is going to be very, or probably much more outspoken against Israel. And I think that one of the things that the Egyptians may well do is try to end the natural gas shipments um, to, eat, to uh, Israel and Jordan. Uh, the question then becomes, can they afford to do it? And this is where the realities of power may be moderating uh, influences or forcing them to be a little bit more realistic. But I do, I am concerned that over the next year that we see that these two issues intersect. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions from the floor. One. And, oh, and the only thing is you have to say who you are, and if you have a specific person you want to ask the question, I'd address them. Well, I'm Joyce Davis. I'm a member of the National Board, and I'm with the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. First, I want to say feel free then, and they pull you back to our friend and ambassador from the Czech Republic. I think it's important that we acknowledge the role the Czech Republic has made in being a home for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And for many years, I've supervised services to the Muslim world to try to get freedom and information and that kind of thing um, dispersed throughout the region. But my real quick yes, they pull your back. So that's a wonderful role that they continue to play. But my real concern and question is this. I still think and concerned about this deep lack of understanding, of misunderstanding about the Islamic world. And you hear it in the, in the tone of the conversation, frankly. Um, yes, there are those. You mentioned Rashid Gamuchi, wrong been a leader, and he's one of the thinkers that will be the bridge between, I believe, the East and the, well, the, the Muslim world and the Western world. But we don't seem to understand that there are grassroots leaders on the ground now that are being formed. And if we are unable to get past this fear, even of Islamists, because I wrote many years ago when I was at the United States Institute of Peace, that we had to learn to make peace with Islam and with Islamists, because they are the way of the future. This is what's going to happen. We're going to have to make peace with these forms of government in that region if we're going to have any relationship. So your comments. Okay, any comments to her observation? I, I have one. I think one of the, I agree very much. The, the one thing that we're not very good at now, uh, 10 years after 9-11, I think we're, there's greater fear than there was 10 years ago, um, or since the Islamic revival began in the 1970s, and understanding that there's a whole spectrum of Islamic activists today. They're not all of the same ilk, uh, and that's one of the things we that that is really interesting. And when you see on the one end groups like the group that won the largest share of votes in Tunisia that recognizes Israel's right to it, well, not, it doesn't, but the, uh, in Turkey and, and Morocco, you have the Justice and Development Parties of the same name that do recognize Israel's right to exist, um, and that have been 
you know, do you, willing to deal with the, the, the Western world, and now that is heading in that direction. In the middle, you have, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, is archaic when it comes to its own leadership role, its policies of minority women, Israel, and so forth. Um, but it has gravitated, and it is under pressure from its own younger membership. And then you have the Salafis on the other end, who are the ones that bore you the most. They are uh, the ones who, ironically, uh, follow the ideology of Saudi Arabia and its Wahhabi sect and our allies. What's wrong? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, are allegedly funded by some of the Gulf. And these are the non-militants I'm talking about, you know, not Hezbollah and Mosque or any of those. I'm talking about those who have renounced violence and there's a whole spectrum. And that's what we need to um, focus on. And it's not that we want to take sides, but we need to understand the degrees and the agendas and the differences among them. Anybody? Okay, let's go over here. Yes, Pam Lachlan from the Delaware Rome Affairs Council. And the country I didn't hear mentioned as a surprise about was Syria. Uh, some six months ago, uh, what, what <laughs> But some six months ago, what I was hearing from knowledgeable people in foreign affairs is that perhaps it wasn't the good government, it wasn't the kind of government we liked, but it was stable and stability was in our interest. Now we seem to have done a complete flop and people at the top echelons of our government are tongue lashing uh, Assad, and my question is, A, do you think we should be, if, uh, should we become involved, should we offer assistance like we did in Libya, or should we back off? I'm going to throw that one and say Ambassador Edward Pani should yeah. answer. Oh yeah, it's a, <laughs> it happens to be a subject to which uh, I've given a fair amount of thought. Um, this is a really tough one. First of all, uh, whatever tongue lashings we're giving them, I don't think we're putting much oomph behind uh, uh, regime change in, in Syria. I think we've been ambivalent about uh, Syria uh, over the years. We've uh, had qualms about the regime. On the other hand, uh, they had their situation under control and we could deal with that. I think there's been an argument that quite a few people have made over the years, and I've heard it, that, well, you know, if you take the lid off that pot, you just don't know what's going to come afterwards. You've got, again, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. You've got this uh, Alawite minority that's less than 10% of the population, but governing uh, essentially uh, uh, Sunni people, and, and with old resentments sort of boil to the point that the country becomes unmanageable and ungovernable over a prolonged period of time. All that said, I think that they have probably been the most reprehensible regime in recent months in terms of the way they uh, treat their people. And you know, darn it, it kind of bothers me that I think that once again, I think they're going to get away with it. Uh, and I, I mean, that really is a, a, I have that uneasy feeling. And last point. Uh, would be that if there is regime change, and admitting that we don't exactly know what would come after, I do think there's a pretty good chance that Iran would lose its only real friend in the Arab world. And I think that would be an important geostrategic development. Absolutely. I, this first time I've disagreed John. I actually think okay. Bashar Assad um, can't survive this politically. Well, I hope you're right. Now, uh, but it may take a while, that's the problem. And who knows what happens along the way, and that's the danger. Uh, whether it fuels parties of, of groups that we don't like. But I think that between King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia is saying that he's no longer legitimate, and King Abdullah was always the contact guy of the Syrian government to deal with um, the, with Syria because of his own family history, um, his mother's history, that uh, the European Union has cut off oil sales in there. That's 95% of foreign exchange uh, economy, you know, it's, and it's really hurting. That's eight or nine million dollars a day in a, uh, a country with a reserve of only thirteen billion dollars. So it's it, it is it is biting. Um, uh, and you have Turkey, which is now giving refuge to this um, um, vectors from the military, and is turned against 
uh, Assad in a way that's really important uh, for on a lot of different levels. You know, the United Nations is now doing a, a daily death count. It's the only one where the UN is coming out and saying they're now 2,600, 2,700, 3,000, whatever. And that's a, a, an important role to legitimize the claims of the opposition. And, and I think the United States and the, and the Europeans have taken, you know, just in terms of morally strong stance. But I agree with John that there hasn't been enough done uh, in terms of squeezing the regime. But I don't, and there won't be. Military, I can I just throw in military? I don't think that, that you can. Do we have a military action? You don't have a, you can't replicate what we did in Libya. Libya, look, Gaddafi was Gaddafi, you know. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and Assad, as bad as he is, does not carry that kind of onus on him. But John should wait. But what you didn't there. mention was, uh, and I'm not that I'm particularly happy about it, having been ambassador to Iraq, but my understanding, the Iraqis are now coming up and giving them a little bit of help. Well, that's because of, you know, because of their pressure from Iran. Yeah. yeah. And that's why it's so important. That Syria is the most important country to watch. Doesn't I mean Egypt and all the others, yes, for other reasons, but Syria is the one. Because then, whether it's the Saudis getting nervous and others saying, well, we really do have to do something um, uh, to accommodate the demands of our people, or the geostrategic balance with Iran and this nuclear program. That, you know, moves out. Really yeah. 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 yeah, Mitchell Krauss from Stanford, Connecticut World Affairs Forum. Uh, Iran uh, is certainly the you know, most important uh, power in that area, it seems to me, in terms of population and, uh, and capacity and threat. What do you see as the uh, internal struggle apparently going on between Ahmadinejad and the, uh, the Ayatollahs and so forth, and will this affect the Iranian policy uh, toward the rest of the I, I just want to point out that I, 40 years ago when I was in government, 30 years ago when I was in, in the Iranian administration, we have been reading about these internal power struggles in Iran ever since, and nothing much has happened. But I will now throw it over to the experts. The lady who wrote a book about it, yeah, right. so you're the expert. Yeah, four. Um, uh, look, the, the fascinating thing about Iran is that the kinds of struggles that are playing out today are not uh, are, you know, at the top among the hardcore, among the conservatives, the revolution is kind of eating itself up. And uh, I'm a believer in the forces of history. I'm a historian by training, and I, you know, that's why I really believe that Iran is headed on the trajectory, but man, is it going to take a while to get there. And it's, as, as John said, it is the spark and catalyst. Who would have known that the Iran-Iraq war would have ended because the U.S. shot down uh, an Iran passenger plane? You know, but that was the moment in which they realized the costs were too great, you know. So that it's going to be something like that that, that changes things. Is it going to be the reformers who, um, who are successful? I don't think they're finished at all, but I think they have to formulate, improve, figure out different ways of doing things. But I think it's, um, you know, revolutions unravel, uh, and all of them have, and, and this one will too. Okay, I'm going to now take the, this the last question and the prerogative of the chair to say that when we started this, I said, what were we doing a year ago, six months ago, today? If you were to come back next year, I want some predictions. What do you think <laughs> the, the conversation will be or where will we be in a year from now? Sir? Well, uh, uh, we've already talked about several spaces to be watched, right? Like Syria and Iran and so forth. I, I'd say another space we have to watch is Iraq because likely the end of this year, our forces will have been withdrawn, and then will come the real test as to whether this political uh, process, which uh, started uh, at, during the coalition provisional authority, will actually continue or not. And, and we don't know. We can hope so. We think a lot of good, positive work has been done. But a year from now, I suspect we'll be discussing that. Sir, Ambassador? Well, um, I think that uh, a lot of work has to be done, particularly in uh, the building uh, the uh, uh, cornerstones of the society. Um, uh, I think that when talking of Iraq, uh, uh, one of the questions was uh, the dismantling of the police. And I think that uh, this is the path the other countries are not following. So we will see how the security apparatus will develop, because this is one of the uh, main uh, areas of concern and uh, again this is not only how to rebuild these uh, forces this is also where to draw the line between those who are allowed to serve on 
and who are not anymore because they have uh, done wrong things, they need to be prosecuted or uh, dealt with. So this is going to be a very uh, painful process for these yeah, So as each of these countries deal with the trade off Unlike of in Iraq, where they got rid of it uh, just like that. And uh, we'll see how they will deal with it. You predicted it all a couple of years ago. Where do you think will be a year from now? Um, you know, I, we've talked about it, so many specifics, and I agree with John that Iraq is one to watch, too. I, let, me, let me go further. Let me take it 10 years down the road. I think all 22 Arab countries will have changed significantly in some way, even in countries where the regime has managed to hold on to power. They will hold on in part because they have uh, they have done something to accommodate the needs of their people. I think one of the things that's interesting about the shapeups of the Persian Gulf, where we have provided the most support, or policy has changed the least because of issues of oil, stability, Iran, and, and so forth, that the um, that they will that in true Jordan and Morocco as well, that they will increasingly have to become constitutional monarchies in order to survive. That um, they can't continue to be absolute monarchies or where the king basically can undo anything that even an elected parliament can. Uh, so I think we're in for, you know, as I said, a wild ride. Um, it will be uneven and uh, a moment of concern. Um, and it won't end the decade. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and I would say a year from now you have to come back and see if their predictions are right. <laughs> <laughs> now